Greetings everybody and welcome to the fifth video in the Manifold series. Today we're taking a look at tangent spaces. These things are absolutely awesome. We're going to be using them basically all the time now from now on because yeah, it's just it's so useful to have the notion of a tangent space to find so many things using them. So I'm pretty excited to get these next few videos done. Um, however, it is going to be a fairly tricky, I guess, video, especially if you haven't seen all this manifold and tangent space stuff already. Um, it's going to be pretty unintuitive at first, but hopefully by the end of this video, or at least if you watch it maybe once more again, it might make a little bit more sense. Roughly what we're going to define is we're going to have, well, first of all, a manifold. So let's draw some kind of um, manifold here. For First of all, we need to let M be a smooth manifold. And we know what a smooth manifold means. It means it comes with an, a topology and a smooth atlas and so on. And what we want to do with this manifold is we want to fix a point P. So fix our attention to a point P in our manifold. And what we want to do is define the tangent, or the full name is tangent, so vector space at the point P in our manifold. So if we draw a picture, we might have a manifold that looks um, something like this over here. So this is our manifold M. And what we're going to do is we're going to fix a point yeah, P in our manifold here. And what we want to do is define what's called a tangent vector space. And you might think about this as kind of like a tangent plane lying in your manifold here somewhat. But this is actually a very, very bad picture to draw at first because the tangent vector space is not a tangent plane. Why is it not a tangent plane? Well, how do you usually imagine a tangent plane? If our manifold is embedded in three dimensional in some way, then you might think of this as, yeah, you have a point and you have the tangent plane that kind of cuts across here. But our manifold here, this is a smooth manifold. It's still a very, very abstract space. We have no clue how this might even be embedded. We're just given yeah, this manifold as it is. How is it even embedded? So how are you even supposed to draw a tangent plane? It makes no sense whatsoever. So even though when we say tangent space, you might think of a tangent plane in some way, that is the absolute incorrect way to think about it, even though it's nice to visualize things this way, which we will do later on. But tangents vectors and the tangent space, they are not yeah, sticking out to even manifold in like yeah, a plane like you usually would imagine it would be. It turns out they're going to be defined in terms of a directional derivative. So we're given a manifold, we're not thinking about this extrinsically at all, which means we embed it in some way in some high dimensional space. We're given a manifold, we think about it intrinsically. So we want to construct the idea of a tangent vector to our manifold in some way. So yeah, how exactly are we going to start doing that? Well, I'm going to go against what I said here, and I'm going to draw yeah, some kind of tangent vector just to give you an idea of what we're trying to do. At our point B, we want a notion of going in a certain direction over here. So how might we want to recover this tangent vector? Well, what we could do is we could imagine we have some curve running through our manifold. Let's do this. Let's do this in red. Why not? So we have a curve running through our manifold, and we could say differentiate a curve at the point B, and it might give us a tangent vector. So what we're going to do is we're going to let gamma from R to M be a smooth curve. And we know exactly what it means for a curve to be smooth from last video. So a smooth curve. Now, just without loss of generality, just to make things slightly simpler in terms of writing things down, we're going to assume that gamma of zero is equal to p. If it's not p, then you can always just you know, readjust the parameter range over here. So when your parameter value is zero, you're at the point p. Right now, if your manifold, if it's a surface in three-dimensional space, let's just take that as an example, and you have a curve that runs through your surface in three-dimensional space, well, you can kind of construct a vector here already. What you could just simply do is say that vector is a gamma prime of zero. But from last video, we know that this guy doesn't even exist. It doesn't even make sense because he cannot differentiate a curve on your manifold because he can't take the difference quotients there. So that's a bit of a problem. We have a curve on the manifold, and we can't exactly differentiate that curve to get some kinds of tangent vector as we usually would in yeah, multivariable calculus where we're imagining surfaces embedded in high dimensional spaces or whatsoever. So yeah, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? We can't differentiate a curve in order to generate some kinds of tangent vector. 
Okay, but if we can't differentiate a curve, then perhaps we could differentiate along the curve, and that might give us a notion of going in a specific direction along a curve. So let's try to differentiate something along the curve. And what's something we can differentiate along a curve? Well, a function, to be precise. So what do we have so far? We have this gamma here. Now this really comes from yeah, R and this gamma goes into the manifold, what we're going to try to do now is instead of exactly just differentiating this gamma, which we can't do, this is illegal here, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to construct a function on our manifold to differentiate along the curve. So we have a function here, which is going to be an element. Now, this needs to be a smooth function because we're going to differentiate it. So it needs to come from the set C infinity M, which we took a look at last time. It's just a set of all smooth functions on our manifold. And this takes us back to R. Okay, this is really nice because if you take a look at this picture here, what we have now is if we consider the composition, this is the composition F after gamma, this guy, this is a map that takes you from R to R. And we know exactly how to differentiate a map that goes from R to R. That's awesome. So we can differentiate this guy now, but yeah. How do we still produce this tangent vector? How, how on earth does that work there? Well, we're gonna try to figure that out soon, hopefully. So we know how to differentiate this F after gamma, and let's differentiate exactly at this point. So how do we differentiate exactly at the point P here? Well, because we make this assumption that gamma of zero is P, what we can do is we can differentiate F after gamma, we differentiate this guy, so we put a prime here, and then we want to evaluate this at, yeah, at this point, but we have to put in the parameter value of zero, right? So this is going to give us a number. So this guy here, this is going to be just some real number here, because we differentiate and then we evaluate the function. Okay, but how on earth does that give us the tangent vector still? What, what even is the tangent vector at this point? And we're differentiating a function now, like this, this number, what is this number really? Well, it doesn't matter what that number is. What we really want to recover is the action of differentiating the function along the curve. That's actually what's gonna become the tangent vector. It's a bit funny, but the tangent vector is gonna be a directional derivative. So if you take a look at this guy here, what we really wanna recover is the action of differentiating along the curve gamma. And that action of differentiating along the curve gamma, we're going to call that x, gamma, and then p. And then we're going to feed in our function here. And then we define this to be well, the derivative of whatever this is, f after gamma, at a zero. So just to be clear, what exactly is this right-hand side here? We're taking some random function and we're simply differentiating along the curve at the point P that we're differentiating along that specific direction. And the action of differentiating along that specific direction using that curve, well, that's gonna be this guy over here. This is precisely the action. So to be precise, this is what we call the directional derivative along the curve gamma at the point P. And that x gamma p, this is what we realize as being the tangent vector. It's really funny. It's, it's really quite yeah, unintuitive that this is going to be the tangent vector. But you just got to believe it's the tangent vector for now. And hopefully by the end of this video, it kind of makes a bit more sense why we call it the tangent vector. So if we have a curve over here, then we have a look at the points p. Then right at that point p, we have this idea of going along a specific direction, and we want to recover some idea of going along that specific direction at the point P there, and the only way we can really do that is to consider a directional derivative operator, which is what we call X gamma P. And of course, this directional derivative operator well, has to differentiate something, in particular a smooth function, so we to define its action on a smooth function in this way here. So yeah, this X gamma P, well, it's a directional derivative operator here. It's, it's funny to call it a tangent vector, but at the end of the day, we're gonna construct a tangent vector space. And a vector space, well, it's just a set of, of things, and this just happens to be one of the things inside of the vector space. And those things inside of the vector space, these are what we call vectors. In particular, because it came from the tangent vector space, this is what we're gonna call a vector. So we've kind of successfully constructed a vector at the point P. And you could imagine if you have another curve, let's see if I can find another color. 
if you have another curve running through your manifold, let's say right over here, so if you have another curve that's yeah, running along this direction now, this is going to give rise to a completely different vector along that curve. So might, um, you might draw something like this. So just be careful, these blue arrows that I draw, these aren't really sticking out of the manifolds. These are just to give a way to represent directional derivative operators. So tangent vectors to manifolds, they are not sticking out of the manifold on a tangent plane or whatsoever. They're just simply directional derivative operators. And that's how we get the notion of yeah, going along a specific direction at a point on the manifold. And of course, you could imagine if you go through the curve twice as fast, you might have a vector with twice the length. Well, the problem with the length is that you have no notion of lengths of vectors yet because it's just an abstract vector in a vector space. We'll get lengths later when we define things like metrics. And now before we try to construct the tangent vector space, it's also worth knowing one small fact here. I mean, it's, I guess it's fairly obvious, but so these directional derivatives, x, gamma, these are linear maps. Why exactly are they linear? It's because they're defined in terms of the derivative operator and differentiation is linear. So in particular, if you have a tangent vector and you act on the sum of the two functions, this is going to give you, you have x acting on one function, which gives you a real number, and then you have x acting on the other function, which gives you another real number, so the, yeah, the sum is still a real number. And of course, you can scale things as well. So if you have x and gamma p, and then you apply some scalar constants that let's say c times your function f, then you can pull the c out because it's linear. So this is x gamma p acting on f. And that's probably something you could prove if you want to try that. So these tangent vectors, which are really just directional derivative operators, they're linear maps. So now we're ready to define the tangent space and we'll take a look more into the tangent space in the next video. So now we say um, the set, and we give the set a special name. It's called t. And then we fix the points P in our manifold there. So we put a subscript down P. Um, and then we put our manifold M here. So this TPM, this is what we call the tangent vector space at the point P. And this is simply defined to be the set of all these X gamma P's here, such that gamma is some smooth curve through your manifold. And also gamma of zero hits the points P because he wants your yeah, curve to pass through the points P. Otherwise, you can't really define a derivative at the points P. So it's a set of all these guys here. So let's draw out another little manifold. So you have a manifold here. And you could imagine you have a bunch of curves running through. So maybe yeah, something like this here. And then you hit the points P through all of them. Now, along the blue curve, if you define a directional derivative, you might represent it by, um, let's say, this arrow here. Now, if you try to define a tangent vector along the red curve, you might get something that, you know, that looks like this. And now, if you try to define one along the yellow curve, well, what you might realize is sometimes you might get the exact same thing. So two curves might produce the exact same tangent vector, because roughly speaking, at that point, they're going along the same direction at the same rate. So you might get two copies of really the exact same tangent vector in this set that's produced by multiple different curves. So if you want to construct this properly, you might want to put some kind of equivalence relation on here to identify the same tangent vector. But I don't think you really need to do that because yeah, if you have really the same object, even if it's constructed in different ways, well, because it's in a set, you don't really count it twice. So it's fine just to write it down this way. And let's say you have another curve that's exactly the same thing as the blue curve over here. So you might have a green curve now. Don't know if you guys can see that, but let's say it runs twice as fast now. So you run at double parameter speed, then what you could represent the directional derivative as is just a vector with twice the length, let's say. So lengths don't mean anything yet. We don't know what lengths mean yet because we don't have any way to measure them. We'll get them with a metric later on. Um, but yeah, that's roughly the idea. So if you collect all these tangent vectors together, you have at the points P here, you have vectors pointing in all sorts of directions. In our heads, we might think about it as some kind of tangent plane, but really it's not a tangent plane. There's no vector pointing out of your manifold, they're just a bunch of directional derivatives. That constitutes the set of TPM. And we can, in fact, turn this into a vector space by defining addition and scalar multiplication. So we can try to find some addition operation on this vector space. Let's say um, x plus y, these are two tangent vectors in this vector space. Well, how can you even define this? Well, this is a directional derivative operator, really. So it has to act on a function, and you can just simply define this to be 
the first vector acting on f and then a plus a y acting on f. And then you can also do the same thing for scalar multiplication. So let's say lambda x and then this acts on a function f. So you can scale your vectors now, but the result is something that still acts on a function. So you have to define this to be lambda times x acting on f like so. So roughly speaking, what we're doing here, we have these tangent vectors. We can take two tangent vectors, we can kind of add them together, and then we might be able to produce some, let's say the green vector plus the red vector, we might be able to produce another vector here. Now, I might make a video where I do this construction in more detail because this is a little bit hand wavy here. You have to make sure that this vector even exists, first of all, which means you have to be able to find some smoother curve that it's yeah, tangents to, I guess. But if you're just here for the rough idea, then this is all you really need to know. You can add the vectors in this way, and you can scale the vectors in this way. And if you define those operations, you can check the vector space axioms as well, which I won't do. I won't bore you guys with that. What you get is that TPM is a vector space. And the full name, because, well, it's made out of yeah, directional derivative operators, you call this the tangent vector space, or sometimes we just call this the tangent space. At the point P, of course. Right, so this TPM here, this set of just directional derivative operators, you can make it into a vector space, and because now this guy is a vector space, you call its elements vectors. That's exactly why we called these directional derivatives here vectors to begin with. It's because it's part of this set TPN, which is a vector space. So yeah, that's basically all for this video. So tangent spaces, they are not tangent planes or anything. We define them to be directional derivative operators because we really want to recover a notion of going along a certain direction in a manifold. You can't differentiate a curve to you know, get that vector, so the only way to do it is to define some kind of directional derivative operator. And those operators are exactly what we think of tangent vectors because they kind of point us in a certain direction. And of course, you can scale these directional derivative operators and you can, um, if you have two directional derivative operators, you can add them together to get another one going in some direction. And yeah, that's basically what this tangent vector space gives for us. It gives us the notion of directions at a point in our manifold. So in the next video, we're gonna take a look at tangent spaces in more detail. We're gonna take a look at how we can construct a basis for this tangent space, which will be very useful later on when we take a look at yeah, cotangent spaces and yeah, everything beyond that, I guess. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. And yeah, if it's still confusing, just watch it again a bunch of times or read things on the internet everywhere. But yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone in the next video. Bye-bye.